All right, what's up, Facebook world? So um, it's Mike Morrison here with Morrison's Outdoor Adventures. I'm here doing the uh, Southern Four Wheel Drive TechNet series. Um, we are on, I believe, we're on number eight. Wow, we're getting up there in the numbers. Um, so we've had some awesome ones, and tonight is no different. Um, tonight we have uh, Jake from Cardo Tracks. Uh, he is going to talk to us about modern cartography and kind of modern map making what's out there what options are out there for um us off-roaders and uh what type of information we need to be looking for so he's got a bunch of information about it before we get into that just a uh, couple of things just like the rest of our um streams and things like that go ahead in the comments post a question and pre preface it with a q so that it'll kind of pop up and we can log it. And then at the end of the stream, Jake and I will sit down and do a Q&A session, okay? So let's have plenty of questions for him to ask. This is the ultimate opportunity to ask someone who is an expert in their field. Um, after that, the next thing on the list, weekly prize. So this week on the list is a um, free certificate for a map from Cardo Tracks, as well as a pair of worn winching gloves. In order to get that, you need to comment during the live video, cartography rocks, right? So go ahead and comment down there, um, cartography rocks, uh, down in the comments, okay? So, and again, that is for a certificate from Carta Tracks for a map, as well as a pair of worn winching gloves. Who could ask for a better combo? A map to find a place to get stuck and a pair of gloves to help you get out. So uh, next on the list, also, I know a lot of you are here again looking for those free BFG tires, right? This is another chance to get entered for that. So BFG tires, comment, I like BFG, and then add in KM3s or KO2s, whichever one's your favorite, go ahead, go ahead and add it in. I like BFG KM3s or KO2s, whichever one's your favorite tire. So go ahead and do that. Put that down in the comments, um, and I'll pop that up a little later, too, so that we can kind of uh, refresh everybody's memory. But remember, this has to be during the live stream that you have to do that. Next on the list, I want to, um, again, urge everyone, share these videos. Tell all your friends, tell your mom, your dad, aunt, uncle, their dog's hairdresser, whoever you got to tell. Share it. Put it out there. Help Southern get the information out there. Help Southern build their brand and their name. Um, if you are not a member of Southern, what are you waiting for? Go to www.sfwda.org and become a member. Remember, by becoming a member of Southern Four Wheel Drive, it also gives you another chance to enter for a set of those BFG tires. The drawing will be held at Dixie Run. You do not have to be present to win. That is five, not four, not three, not two, not just one, but five BFG tires. Five BFG tires. Who needs a free set of tires? Everybody does. So go ahead, become a member of Southern. It doesn't matter what level you become, but we would love for you to become a, a premium member. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring Jake in and introduce him so that everyone gets kind of the opportunity um, to hear him talk a little bit about herself, about himself, and then we will jump right into his presentation, which for me, I know I keep telling you guys I got favorite subjects, but this is one subject I know very little about, but I love map navigation, all that cool kind of techie stuff. I really geek out about it um, almost as much as I geek out about winching, but this is a subject I know nothing about. So let me bring Jake in here. So um, with us, we've got Jake from Carta Tracks here. Hey, Jake, how's it going? Howdy. Good evening. Good evening. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Jake, and um, how you got into uh, cartography. Well, I started out um, just as a kid, like a lot of kids do, riding around in the backseat of a car on road trips. And I'm a little different in that my dad is a geologist. So if I ever dared ask how much further, he would literally throw a map at me and say, figure it out. So that's pretty much how my start began in maps and, and learning how to read maps and using my eyes to look outside the window and see what I'm seeing and then interpret where I am based on what maps laying in my lap. So 
Um, a lot of credit to dad for that and uh, scouting. Grew up in scouts. I'm an Eagle Scout, so a lot of navigation uh, that I was taught in scouting that probably helped a lot. And then when I went on to college, I studied geography. That was actually my field of study in school. Um, so a lot of earth science kind of stuff. I minored in geology, majored in geography. So uh, that's kind of my background. And then um, I've had a Jeep Scrambler since I was 16 years old. So I've been driving a Scrambler daily for over half my life now. Um, so I've been a wheeler for a long time. And um, anyway, long story short, uh, a lot of off-road park in Tennessee called Gold Mountain Park. Most of y'all are familiar with it. Southern's had Dixie run there for years. They're opening back up soon. Um, they needed a map. A friend of mine was making a website for them, and, and the friend called me and said, hey, I know you're a map guy. Can you do something? And I said, sure, we'll figure it out. And um, that's pretty much where Carta Track started was with Golden Mountain Park, and we've kind of leapfrogged all over the place since then. Um, it's just my wife and I. We're both map people. She also did the same fields of study. So cartography, she's actually, I joke, but it's true. She's the one that makes it all look pretty. Um, I'm the one that is the face of the company. I'm the, the, um, the voice. <laughs> That's a joke. If Jeff, Jeff Dodgen's watching, I know he'll laugh at that. Um, but I am, I'm kind of the face of the company, but Jennifer's kind of the wizard behind the curtain. And she's the one that makes the maps look good from the data that I collect out in the field on the trail. So, um, anyway, that's kind of how it all started where we are now. We're, about six, seven years in now. Um, I think this was the sixth year of mapping King of the Hammers race courses, which is pretty big for us. Um, aside from all the off-road parks that we've mapped and, and individual trails and that kind of thing. So um, anyway, Southern's been really supportive of us. We've been supportive of them. We appreciate everything that Southern does. So it's just kind of our way to give back some of our knowledge on what's out there in the off-road world for modern off-road navigation. Uh, cause there's a lot out there. It's pretty mind boggling to a novice wheeler, um, and navigator to try and understand what are some of the best options to figure out how to navigate in the woods. Um, and there are a lot of options. So that's the point of this talk tonight is to kind of talk through a lot of those. This is not a hundred percent car to track show. I'm going to cover a lot of topics and a lot of different options. We'll do a little history lesson to start out with, which is, I think some of y'all will find kind of cool. Um, some some background, some surprising stuff that most folks don't know, and then we'll move into what all's available today um, and, and talk through those, and then we'll have some question time at the end. So if anybody's got some questions, um, Mike will probably be taking some notes, I think, tonight with those questions, and then he'll fire them away at me when we get done, and, and I'll see if I can field some of them. Hopefully I know answers. If not, I'll just make them up. So. <laughs> There you go. Awesome. Very cool. So, um, yeah, make sure you guys go check out www.cartotracks.com. Um, go to their website. That's where you can purchase their maps and kind of download them. Um, I've worked with several of their maps as a trail guide. Um, they are invaluable uh, is from that perspective. But even as just kind of an, uh, uh, out there for recreational purposes, a good map could save you uh, a ton, right? So without uh, stealing any more of Jake's thunder, I'm going to go ahead and jump off here and let Jake take over. But remember, throw your questions up, preface it with a cue, and we'll ask Jake and see if we can get some answers at the end. All yours, Jake. All right. Carter Track Maps can give you unparalleled access to custom maps complete with topographical contours, accurate trail data, and points of interest. Accurate vetted data and information including trails and important points of interest. No service required. Your location will be automatically updated by GPS as you go. With over 25 years of experience, Cardo Tracks maps are clean and easy to use, complete with contour lines, letting you know what is up and what is down. Cardo Tracks, smart mapping. All right, so we'll start into this and dive right on in. This is what I consider modern off road navigation. There are a lot of options out there. We'll talk through these. Um, I, I do want to first and foremost thank Southern Four Wheel Drive Association and Tread Lightly 
the principles in Tread Lightly are invaluable and really, really important. And it's kind of interesting, a lot of the tread principles uh, that you may or may not know and what the word tread stands for, uh, a lot of those tie into maps. So we'll talk through these real quick. Um, the travel responsibly is the first one in T of tread, and that's staying on designated roads, trails, and areas. This is really important. Obviously, there's a, an obvious connection with maps. How else can you do that and stay on those roads if you don't have a solid map that can tell you how to do that? Um, the second, the R, respect the rights of others, including private property owners. We'll get into this a little bit later in this discussion this evening uh, about some apps that are out there that allow you to actually see who owns what properties. It's really cool, some of the technology that's available to be able to see that pretty easy at your fingertips. Um, so that's important. Mapping, again, located there in that R. Educate yourself. <clears throat> Very important especially if you want to go in and uh, make sure you're following the laws and, and staying off of people's private property, getting the proper maps um, and learning all the different regulations and training and the skills necessary. Um, National Forest, they have seasonal closures. A lot of those pieces of information can be derived from maps uh, to know when you can and cannot go in those areas. UR is a great example in Central North Carolina. Uh, they have a seasonal winter closure every year, so you can find those dates. Um, through their maps and through the Forest Service site. Um, the A is avoiding sensitive areas. Again, maps help you do that. They keep you out of those sensitive areas. Um, Mike, you can go ahead and flip that slide if you want. Uh, there's a lot of areas that are designated uh, in our maps with car tracks, especially when you get out west. Uh, places like Johnson Valley, California, there's desert tortoises out there and there's uh, yucca rings that grow that if you don't know they're there, you can inadvertently tread in those areas that you don't need to be. And so good maps can keep you out of those areas and uh, keep you out of trouble and protect uh, those resources. The last one, the D, is doing your part, uh, modeling appropriate behavior. A lot of that is, is about staying on the trail. And if you go off trail, people follow you. People can see your tracks and they'll think that that's a route. So it's really important to make sure you try and stay on the designated route. If you if you start heading off route, then people see that and, and people just follow. It's just human nature. So lead by example, modeling that appropriate behavior. So those are the tread principles. It's really important. I like to emphasize that, kicking off any of these sessions. I've um, done some classes for Southern in the past, and I always like to try and start out with that because they're important. A lot of people don't know them. It's always good just to hammer those in so we begin to learn them. Um, learn how to act right, basically. So let's talk about some of the, the, uh, the options that are out there for print map options. Um, so some of the more traditional ones, a lot of y'all have seen topo maps, that's topography, lines of equal elevation. Um, those are produced by the U.S. Geologic Survey predominantly. You can go and get those maps. Uh, a lot of places you can buy them still in print format. Uh, some people like hard copy print maps. It's always nice. I love print maps. I like playing with them and looking at them and studying them. It's sometimes just easier to handle a paper map. So those are available through U.S. Geologic Survey. You can also get those. I'll talk about this in a minute. Uh, but Avenza Maps is one of the apps we'll talk about. You can get those maps in there at no charge. DeLorme is an old company. They've actually been bought by Garmin, another brand y'all have probably heard before. DeLorme used to make some giant map books. I think I got one right here. Hang on. Yeah, so here we go. I'll hold it up here in the corner of the screen. Here's a Tennessee map book. There are these big map books that you can flip open. They've got um, multiple pages. Most of them are around $20, but you buy them by state, and they're topographic maps. They're printed. They're actually surprisingly accurate as far as little small rural routes and trails. Um, that are legal. So you can, if it's on the map, most of these are legal. Um, some of them are a little dated, so make sure if you're buying them in a bookstore or something like that or ordering them online, make sure you get the latest editions of them. Uh, but DeLorme's a good option. Uh, the Forest Service and the BLM, they are required to make maps of our land for us. However, they just do the bare minimum. So you're usually getting a black and white map. And one example I like to use a lot in, um, South Dakota, the Forest Service manages a lot of those areas in the Black Hills. Those trails all have a designated Forest Service number, but all the locals have names for the trails. 
and y'all have all seen this someplace, I'm sure, but um, out there, they're all named after kids' cereals. So there might be a trail that the Forest Service calls FS47825, but the locals call that Fruity Pebbles. So there's, it's really hard to use their maps if they don't have the, the local names uh, attributed on those maps. So a little bit of a warning on those, but they're still handy. Um, those are usually in print format. Some of those are moving to digital. We'll talk about uh, where that's headed in the future as well um, with the federal entities. And then you've got uh, local maps that sometimes you just can stumble upon in gas stations and visitor centers. Some of those are surprisingly useful. They're actually really good. Um, especially if you get into national parks, you can find uh, print maps in some of those uh, visitor centers as you enter the park. Um, but then as far as off-roading goes, sometimes you can get some maps locally in those gas stations and, and other um, stores and, and, and um, businesses like that. So then you've got the print guidebooks like the um, I mentioned the DeLorme option. Uh, there's a, a company out in, I think they're based in Colorado or Utah that's pretty famous for their Moab maps and Colorado maps called Funtrex. And they make some really good guidebooks that you can thumb through. Um, the guy's last name, Wells, I believe, that's that family that, that runs that business. Um, and they've been around for quite a, a long time. And they're very comprehensive. They actually go in and discuss like specific details about individual trails. Um, even going into the nitty gritty of what lines to take sometimes on some of those obstacles out west. So those are pretty handy. Again, that's fun treks. So that kind of wraps up things on the print option. There's still stuff around and some of those are actually pretty good options that you shouldn't disregard. Um, so we'll move on to some cool history. Uh, this is a little known fact. A lot of people don't know about this, but way back in 1981, this was the first example of onboard navigation inside of a vehicle. So Honda Motor Company had the, the very first. It ran on cathode ray, ray tubes, which is really, really old school stuff these days. Um, that's something that helped run and power old televisions. Uh, but this system had cathode ray tubes, transparent map sheets that, by the way, if you get to the end of the map, you actually have to pull the card out and put a new one in when you get to the edge of the page. Um, so as you drive off the map, you have to get, have your passenger hand you the next card to the east or whatever, which is kind of funny. But they used a gyroscope that was built in, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, so it could tell what direction you're moving. And then it also had mileage sensors. It also sent information to tell you how far you're going in that direction before you make a turn. So that's basically how it plotted your location on top of that transparent map sheet card. Um, and that was an option in 1981 on the Accord and the Viger, I think is how you pronounce the name of that, that car at that time. And the cost back then was two, for that option was $2,750, which is equivalent to about $7,000 today. So it's pretty funny to look back at that and how rudimentary it is. And it's totally reliant upon the map card. So um, kind of like what we'll talk about in a little bit about apps and the available apps today, uh, it's all dependent on what kind of data you can get in there. So if you don't have good map cards and enough map cards to cover where you're going, it's pretty much useless. So um, you kind of have to prepare yourself for that. But that's kind of a cool history. A lot of people don't know about it. Um, nearly 40 years ago that this was first developed and, and it's just a little known snippet of information that's just kind of forgotten in the annals of time that nobody knows about. But Cool, I like to share it and let you know that's kind of where it started with Honda, of all people and companies. So um, so we'll move on now to what we've got out there as far as what became the first real GPS options. Um, those have kind of evolved a little bit from what we used to call a handheld GPS. So some of y'all remember some of the original Magellans and Garmin's um, that were basically handheld based. They were really good for hunters predominantly. That's kind of how it started for the civilian market. Of course, it started in the military, but when you went over to civilian, this is kind of where it first landed and how it started was handheld. Um, and Garmin and Magellan were really the innovators in that field for developing the hardware. That has now progressed. Those are still available. They're still out there. Uh, we still, in fact, some of our early maps that we made started with a, a handheld Garmin like this. This is an old uh, 62S um, Garmin. Um, so that was an option. 
uh, but then they've evolved, and so now Garmin and Magellan are both making a more like a tablet style unit. The Garmin version is called the Overlander. Um, so that one is designed to you, you load data, preload data. Some of it comes preloaded, and then you can subscribe to get more information and data into it. But it's all preloaded and allows you to to load different background layers like imagery and topography and then that kind of thing and then import other data on top of that so a lot of the data that they utilize and make available is crowdsourced data we're going to talk about that in a little bit but they're basically sourcing their data from users so some of that carries some risk we'll get into that in a little bit i don't want to jump ahead but um and then they have lots of really good open source data that comes from um all this open street data that you can access so a lot of the roads it's pulled from counties all over the country all over the world really um, and that's all brought into the same unit they've got some cool little features in the garmin overlander there's a i think there's a, a roll indicator so you can actually see how far your vehicle is is leaning on off camber situations so you can pull that up um, i believe there's even like a um, street camera so you've got a camera i think on the front that can record uh trip and stuff magellan makes a trx that's their model it's a very similar unit a lot of the same kind of features so they're kind of in competition with one another um, really what that comes down to is if you want to pay for an independent hardware unit you can mount that um, but i don't really think that there's much else you can do you don't have access to the the google play or the apple stores in those so that's just something to consider. I think you're you're pretty much buying it for a designated GPS unit, but that works for some people. Um, Lowrance is the name down at the bottom. If you are tuning in from out west, you're probably more familiar with this. They seem to be really popular with racers and desert wheelers that are out west a lot. Um, the main reason is it has a really large screen. Racers like to have a um, big buttons that are easy to push, especially with fire retardant gloves on when they're in a race environment and required to wear those. They have to have buttons. So the Lowrance units, yes, this is the same Lowrance that makes the fish finders that go on your bass boat, if you're recognizing that name. It's the same company. In fact, it's just a glorified fish finder, but it can import GPS data. So folks use that. They've come a little bit further advanced. They've got some color screens and touch screens. Um, so that's pretty popular out there. Again, it's just all a matter of what you can import into it. So you've got to get the data on your own. It doesn't come with any preloaded data. Um, so that's kind of a bit of an issue and something to consider. But those are some of the, the, the main ones. There's one other down at the bottom here is Insane Audio. And that is an in-dash replacement head unit that would replace your stereo in a Jeep or a Toyota. I think they're mostly Jeep, but you might be able to fit in a Toyota. But it's basically a big head unit that replaces your radio that has a screen. And so it's basically, those are Android driven. And so you can go to the Google Play Store and any, any app you can download from the Google Play Store, you can download into that device. Um, the price is pretty high, I guess, relatively speaking. I'm sure it's more than a Garmin or a, a Magellan, but it does a lot more. It can control your audio. You can play music through it and stream and do all that kind of thing. Uh, but you can also download from the Android Google Play App Store. So that's pretty useful. So you've got a lot of options there if you have access to that App Store to download a lot of the apps that we're about to talk about in a little bit. But that's an independent standalone unit that fits inside your dash. So it's like hard mounted. So that pretty much covers those old, um, not old, but just the handheld and the standalone style units that are just independent for that. So. So moving on, we're going to go back into the world of the iPhone, which is um, really what probably a lot of you have come to, to know very well. Um, it's still a relatively new technology when you really get down to it. It's, what, 13 years old? It was The first iPhone was released on June 29, 2007. Um, a big deal. People stood in lines like they still do outside of stores to go and buy these things. But it really changed the world as far as what all we can do. And we have a really powerful computer now in our hands. Um, so it's really pretty crazy what all it's done and how it's changed everything. Um, and once Apple put theirs out, of course, the Android market flooded in right soon after. Um, and, and now they're in heated competition constantly about who can better put better cameras on them and better sensors in them and, and better storage and just across the board everything about it it's just a great competition so um with that being said this actually opens 
the, the door to a lot of apps and options that are really useful in off-road navigation because you just have so many things that you can access now. Um, and it's kind of like having a lot more tools in your garage, really. You, it's good to have a lot of tools if you want to work on your vehicle because you never know which ones you might need. So you've got a lot more tools in your toolbox depending on what you're doing in an off-road environment where you're going. So there may be some maps of some areas and they're not available in a certain application, but they're available in others. So I encourage everybody, there's really no reason just to stick entirely with one. It's great to be able to download a lot of different options um, and, and have all those stored on the phone at any time. And you can always toggle through them. If one fails you for whatever reason, you can go to another. So, uh, but anyway, the, the stores really change things. The, the tablets and the iPads help folks that uh, may have a little harder time seeing the phone screen. They're, they're small relatively compared to a tablet or an iPad. So, um, you, and you can also just use your phone as it's intended to be used. You can take pictures, do whatever you want with it. Just leave the tablet or iPad in your rig um, and hard mount it or whatever. And um, that's a really useful thing. A lot of people like that. I prefer it. I like having that huge screen. It's really nice. Um, we usually run an iPad mini which is um, a little bit smaller than your full-size iPad, but it's still bigger than a phone. So it's kind of a happy medium, and it doesn't cover up a lot of dash space. So um, that's, that's my point, my, my preference at least. So let's delve into the satellite options and what all is available. So we all know that GPS was developed by the government probably. I know a lot of folks already know that. Um, so GPS is Global Positioning System. That's what that stands for. And that's Specifically, when we break this down a little bit, you have GPS, which is the U.S. government satellites that we've launched. There's another one out there, a whole other constellation of satellites that was developed by the Russians, and it's called GLONASS. And I would try and tell you what that an acronym stands for, but I don't speak Russian, so I have no idea what those words are, but it's some kind of an acronym for something Russian, probably like GPS, but longer words. So anyway, you got GLONASS also. And so the old school Garmin's like this guy that I'm holding was only accessing the US GPS constellation. And earlier smartphones were also only accessing the US constellation. So, for example, if you're in a deep canyon in Johnson Valley, California, and the canyon walls are real narrow, so if you can see my arms, we're basically looking up through the canyon walls. At any given time, you might only have three or four satellites that are US GPS satellites. So your accuracy is only so good as how many you can see in that window that you can see between the canyon walls. Things changed when the technology started to evolve a little bit, when these started uh, storing new chips that could access the GLONASS constellation as well. Our phones now access the GLONASS constellation. And they also, the phone also utilizes the cellular network to find your location. So using that example again in the canyon, out in Johnson Valley, California, you're in Jackhammer, one of the trails or something, it's super tight walls. Um, you're now seeing the three or four GPS satellites. You're seeing three or four GLONASS satellites. Now you're maybe up to 10 in that window. And then you're also maybe, if you're lucky, and have Verizon perhaps in Johnson Valley, which is about the only thing that works out there for cellular signal, you're also using that. So your phone can become a lot more accurate now thanks to our visibility of all these different aspects of, of um, the constellations that are above you. So you've got more targets to hit basically to be able to interpolate where your location is. So that's cool. A lot of people haven't even heard of GLONASS. If you have, um, great. If you haven't, that's basically what it is. It's just another set of constellations. Um, it's not a spy satellite. It just is helping you with your location. So what's about to change <clears throat> of late is a new constellation that's going to be launched by the U.S. government and, and independent contractors um, is something called GPS-3. And this is the next era of GPS that is coming very soon. Um, the first one of these was launched by Lockheed Martin, and it was named Vespucci, and this guy cost $529 million. Very, very expensive satellite. Um, it was launched back in December of 2019. There are nine more coming. 
there's a total estimated cost of, wait for it, $5.5 billion. What does it do? So the other system that I was talking about where we're seeing just the old school GPS satellites and the GLONASS satellites and cellular network can get you somewhere in the five to 10 meter range, typically. That's, that's usually the accuracy we as civilians can access. GPS-3 is gonna allow us to be able to accurately locate ourselves one to three meter accurate, which is just incredible. That is really, really, really accurate. And when you get out west, when you don't have any tree canopy like you have in the East Coast, um, that will probably be below one meter typically, uh, which is really incredible. Um, and that's really exciting for us as a business. That just means that we've got to stay on our A game for our accuracy of our data that we're collecting as a business um, because it can show you deviating off that line now, whereas before your accuracy of your device really wasn't so good as the data we were collecting. So it kind of gets you in the ballpark. You know if you're on the trail or not, but now you can get a couple of feet off and know that you're deviating off of that trail. So. Um, this should be operational by 2023. However, there's some lag time, most likely, with the cell phone providers, with Apple and Samsung and all the different manufacturers of smartphones and GPS units, the standalone units, to catch up to be able to build the sensors that go in those devices that can then communicate with the GPS-3. So there could be a little bit more lag, but at earliest 2023, I'm sure they're all scrambling now to figure out how to connect to those before they're even up. Um, but that's pretty exciting news. That's pretty cool. A lot of people don't even know about that yet. So um, we're launching, launching these now. And um, so over the course of the next few years, before 2023, we'll have nine more going up in space that'll be in orbit um, to add to that constellation. So it'll be it's exciting stuff. So that'll be pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to go on to this next slide here, and that is buying mobile. So if you want to go and buy a mobile device and you're trying to decide, like for instance, if you want to buy an iPad or a tablet, um, Samsung makes the tablets um, and Apple makes the, the, the iPads. Uh, there's other brands out there aside from Samsung, but as far as iOS devices, it's Apple only, obviously. Um, but if you want to buy one of those, and I get asked this a lot, what do I buy? What do I buy? What kind of tablet? What kind of iPad? I always tell folks, no matter which platform, Android or iOS, always buy for the screen size. So figure out what you can fit in your vehicle without blocking, if you have air conditioning, don't block your AC vents, don't block your windshield, um, but figure out how you can fit it, where you can fit it in, maybe borrow a friend's and hold it up and kind of mock up how you can fit it in there. So trying to determine what screen size you want to buy. Um, the other thing I always talk about that I recommend to people is to read in the fine print on that device before you buy it, um, if it has built-in GPS or not. If it doesn't, if it doesn't have a built-in GPS sensor inside the unit, then you're probably going to need to buy an additional device. That These are on the screen here on the right, the, um, the red dot and the Garmin device. Those are external Bluetooth GPS receivers. What that allows you to do is to mount that device outside of your vehicle or maybe up on the roof by a magnet or however you want to fix it to the vehicle. I've got an overhead console that I keep my, my radios in. I stick it on top with a magnet and then it talks by Bluetooth back to your iPad or tablet and basically set, you tell the device, hey, I want to take signal from this that's mounted up on the roof and not the internal device. And that really helps quite a bit as far as accessing signal. If you're underneath the metal roof, maybe a real steep windshield like in a Jeep, and you've got the device mounted back on your dash, it's not seeing all the satellites quite as well because it's trying to see through all that metal. So this helps quite a bit help your accuracy. These vary in cost. I haven't looked lately, but they're usually between 100 to 150 bucks a piece. Um, rechargeable. They're very handy. I really like it. I've got a Garmin. This thing's called like a Garmin Glow. See that way down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I've been really happy with it. I've heard great results from people using the dual GPS. There's a website of a company out in Vegas, I believe, called GPS City. They are a really good source to go and find these. Um, as far as also with all those other handheld devices we talked about a bit earlier, GPS City is a good option. Um, their prices are pretty competitive. Of course, you got Amazon as well. Um, but anyway, if you don't have internal GPS in that device, 
uh, realize you probably need to buy an external GPS. Um, and even if it has internal GPS, it's always nice to have these. This just helps improve your accuracy. The other thing too, I'll mention, it helps with refresh rate, which means uh, translation to that, if you're racing out the desert or you're driving fairly quick out in open desert or something like that, um, the internal chip is usually a five hertz refresh rate. And that means the dot is behind you if you're doing 30 miles an hour or something like that. Um, but the devices here on the screen, the, the Dual and the Garmin Glow, they're 10 hertz refresh rate. So the dot stays and keeps up with you as you're moving at speed so you don't miss your turn. Um, so that's kind of nice, and it, and it just helps with signal overall as well. So um, I skipped over the middle part here, good power supply. Running GPS in any device is pretty taxing on the device's battery. It just drains battery. It's just a fact of what it does. The, they're getting better. The batteries are getting better. Um, but I always recommend just make sure you've got a power supply in the vehicle, um, a charger, and... Don't just use a cheap gas station type charger. It's always good if you can wire in. Um, I use a Blue C systems. You can Google that. You can go and search on uh, Amazon and find one of these, but they make a higher amp output USB charger plug connection. So I've wired one of those into the dash of my Scrambler. Um, it's got two USB ports. Both of them are the same higher amp. I, don't quote me on the number. I can't remember what it is. I want to say like 2.4 maybe or something like that amp um, charge so it helps you keep it charged better um, you can also have an external battery some people use those it's like a little piggyback battery pack that you can store nearby and keep it powered that way so just be prepared uh, to drain battery because it's going to happen uh, that way you don't lose access to the maps that you're trying to utilize while you're navigating so just make sure you got power supply that's important so okay Let's see here. So let's get into the apps. There's a lot of apps out there. This is the biggest question people ask me, even outside. I mean, obviously, I'm part of Tracks. My wife and I run part of Tracks. That's our business. We don't have an app yet. Um, that one runs in a Venza map. So you would buy the maps from us through our website and you download them into a Venza maps. Um, so obviously, that's what we would recommend if we mapped it. We're pretty proud of our maps. We think they're pretty good. Um, I hope you do too. Um, so that's the app that runs that. But there's a lot of other apps out there, and there's a lot of places that we haven't mapped yet either. Um, so what can you download? What are the good apps? What are the apps that people are running? That's kind of the big question. So uh, Avenza's top of our list. We're we're pretty big fans of that one. It's a pretty good app. Um, what Avenza is though is it's more geared towards people that make maps. So there's a difference between maps and apps. Apps drive everything, but maps are maps. And so Avenza allows you to download maps into that app and, and utilize those in an offline environment. You can bring data in. And when I talk about data, I'm talking about tracks, like a GPS track that might've been collected or points, lines, areas, those kind of things. Those can be imported in, but this one's not really geared as much for that. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. We'll, we'll just hit the, the main list and I'll go through each of these. So Backcountry Navigator is an Android based one. That's a pretty good one. Gaia is also a pretty good one. That one's uh, Apple only, I think, still. Um, that one's geared more towards bringing data in. Onyx Off-Road is kind of an up and coming app. A lot of people haven't heard of it yet. Um, it's a pretty good one. They've got a background in hunting and access to private and federal land uh, and the parcel data so you can see the perimeters of all, the, all those properties so you know whose land you're on and if you're supposed to be there or not. So that's a nice one. Lifetime Trail Maps, um, they are kind of a little bit different business model in that they're selling preloaded tablets um, that have all the maps already in them um, and the data that's imported in in, a, in an app that's preloaded. So you, you're buying new hardware um, I think they've got an app too, so you might be able to download it to your already existing Samsung tablet, something like that. So um, you kind of have two options there, but that's an Android only still right now. Uh, Lead Nav is a, an option. They're pretty popular out west with off-road racers and desert racing um, and, and just racing in general. There's a lot of features built into that app that are really geared more towards the racer. Um, and then, of course, us down here at the bottom of the list, Carta Tracks Maps and Avenza. So let's go into the Avenza details here. 
we'll talk through Avenza a little bit and I can kind of explain how that works. This is uh, an app that works in Google Play and iOS both. It's available in both platforms. Only those two though. I don't think they've got a Windows option anymore. Occasionally we'll get a, a question about that, but Google Play, you know, Android and iOS. Um, so you can search the app stores for each of those or for this app. Uh, this one works offline. You just have to download the maps prior to going offline and then it cell, no cell signal required, but it's still GPS enabled. So it'll show you that magic blue dot on the map wherever you are, as long as you're on the map. So you can import maps from outside sources into that app. Cartatrax is one of those. There's other ways that you can do that. You can import maps in kind of as your base map. They also have a store built into that app, so you can search their online store, and we'll talk about those options. There's a whole bunch. Um, the one that I use the most is the U.S. Geologic Survey topo maps that I talked a little while back. Those old school topo maps. Um, nerdy talk here, seven and a half minute, one to 24,000 scale is the standard of those. Um, and basically it's just your standard old school topo map. You can download those into that app inside their store for free, which is nice. It's a really cool feature. You can go and access any of those anywhere in the United States um, and download them. So you would just search. The easiest way is just go by map view and you zoom in and you search on their little pins and you tap one and open it up and, and pick the one you need. So and then you just download them. Um, so that's nice. There's a lot of other options in their store. I've downloaded some beautiful maps from National Geographic. They publish maps still today. Um, we've I've got a map in my phone right now that's a two-page map of Zion National Park. When we went walking in the Zion with the family um, and did some hiking and, and driving, for that matter, in, in Zion. Um, so there's some awesome maps out there available in the Avenza Map Store. Uh, we don't sell in there just because of the, the cut that they get. We sell it independently. Um, through our website, but there's still a lot. Don't discredit Avenza for the maps that are available in there. But those are maps and not data um, that you can that you can get there. And there, I mean, there's cartographers all over the world making maps, and a lot of them sell inside their Avenza map store. So just check that out. It's a good one. The app itself is free, um, and that allows you to download up to three maps at one time and store them in the app. If you go over that, they become inactive, and then Avenza asks you to pay about a $30 upgrade fee, uh, like a premium level, I guess you could call it, that unlocks that limit of three. So uh, if you want to import more than three maps from Cortatrax or somebody else, you're limited to three unless you pay the upgrade. So that's just kind of a fair warning. Uh, but you can always delete maps and re-download them from us. If uh, if you need to get the download count bumped up, we can, we can do that for you. So nice and easy. Um, but anyway, Carta Tracks maps work in this app, um, and that's um, the one that we're running now. We're working on our own app. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, but for now, it's still Avenza, and you just buy them on our website. So that's Avenza. Next one up is Backcountry Navigator. I've been using Apple for a little bit now, so I haven't used Backcountry Navigator lately. Uh, but as far as I know, it's still uh, Android only. It's a pretty good app. It allows you to access a whole lot of base maps. So you can go and toggle through USGS topos. Um, I think there's a Cal topo option. There's a whole lot of options. So you can download that one. And like a lot of apps, there's an upgrade if you want to go to more of a premium level and some subscriptions that you can go to as well in order to, um, you know, pick what you need for base maps. But it covers the United States. Um, you can't. So this is the first one I'll talk about where you can import external data. So what? I recommend is basically pick some of these apps that you like, maybe the platform that works for you, um, and download some base maps and then play around with some importing of some data. So there's a lot of options out there we'll talk about again a little bit later uh, about where you can get some of these um, tracks, but you can import them into this app and lay them over your base map, like a topo map or something like that, and kind of create your own map basically. Um, inside these apps. So they're real handy for pre-running and trying to decide where you want to run and, and, and a route you want to take. Um, so that one's handy for that. Um, any data that's in there, as far as I know, I don't think Backcountry Navigator provides any kind of data themselves through the app. I think that it's up to you to import those. 
Um, so anything that comes in is, is essentially crowdsourced or something like that. So you just need to know your source and verify where you're getting that data from and if it's accurate and if it's legal. Um, and again, that one's a subscription-based type platform. So that's Backcountry Navigator, Android only. We'll jump to kind of a comparable app now that's in the iOS platform, and that's Gaia GPS. This one's become extremely popular, uh, especially in the overlanding world. There's a lot of folks that are just wanting to go out and adventure a little bit and figure out where they can go uh, around in the United States and worldwide. Gaia is a pretty good option for that if you have an iOS device. Um, it's very similar uh, as far as what's available in it to the Backcountry Navigator, the Android platform option that I just discussed. Um, so you've got a lot of the same options. I think you've got even more options perhaps as far as base layers go um, in Gaia. And again, it's just kind of upwards in cost as far as how, you want, how much you want to incrementally add on to your subscription as far as what you can access uh, inside the app. So just be aware that it's, I think there's a fee, free base layer, but then as you add in sur subscription level, charges will apply. So uh, just be prepared for that. But again, it's, it's pretty simple to import data in. Um, GPX and KML files are pretty much the most common standards, I guess. KML is really common to, to use in, in Google Maps and Google Earth. So if you want to load it up on a desktop and kind of pre-run, that's a nice file type to use for that. GPX is uh, more proprietary GPX, um, sorry, Garmin uh, file type. So, but those can all be imported into Gaia. Um, and again, just beware, crowdsource data is out there. It's easy to get, it's all over the place. Just try and do your due diligence and educate yourself as far as who collected it. and Is it accurate and is it legal? It's really, really important. And I, I can't stress that enough, just how important that is. And it's not just because, um, you know, it's a bit of a competitor to our business. It's just important from a land use standpoint because there's a lot of instances that I've, I've heard of lately, folks going off, off path, following a track that someone else took and, and put out there on the internet. Um, and it doesn't mean that just because someone went there means that it's right or legal. So just be prepared. I just, I can't stress that enough. Um, so anyway, still great app, really good, useful app and a great way to import and export data um, and even collect your own tracks and share with friends and stuff. If you want to share places, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, that's subscription based. All right. So the next one here we'll talk about is OnX Off-Road. And really the parent company, I guess, is just called OnX. They've got some different um, platforms, I guess, that have been developed. The first one I think was OnX Hunt. And it is a really, really nice app. And really the idea behind it was to make uh, land and property boundaries available and readily available for hunters. So um, maybe you're hunting on a particular um, uh, public game lands type situation or property or whatever that's federal land or whatever. Um, you shoot a deer, it runs off, jumps over a fence, and all of a sudden it's on private property. And you got to figure out how to get in touch with that that landowner to go and get your deer. Um, this app allowed hunters to do that in a real easy environment to go and access that. I think you download it by state, so you can get the whole state as far as um, the properties and then access um, you know, whoever owns that property to try and track the deer. So uh, that's where it came from. They've applied this to this new platform called Onyx Off-Road. Um, there's a desktop option where you can go in and access a lot of stuff and import data and inf information. You're logged in by your account um, there, and you can do a lot of pre-running and that kind of thing and, and, and kind of scouting it out on a desktop. So a big giant screen with your mouse and you can click and drag and do all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but then you can apply that to your account and then access it in an app on your phone, the Onyx Off-Road um, app. So the things that you apply to your desktop then transfer over into your phone, which is pretty cool. That's a nice feature. Um, and you can access that property data really easily. So you can kind of pre-run and plan, um, you know, can I go to these places legally? Do I need to get permission if it's on, uh, you know, a crossing of some private land or some situation like that? So that's pretty handy. Um, really more useful, I guess, in the, in the um, uh, Western United States 
it seems to be more of a an issue out there where you're there may not be fences or signage like what we have in the eastern United States with trees and no trespassing signs and that kind of thing. It's it's kind of wide open out there in places. So this is a really nice way to be able to see in a virtual environment, you know, whose land you're on. Um, a lot of their data that they have and make available in Onyx Off-Road right now is still crowdsourced. Um, so they're sourcing their data from riders. So as people ride, they can upload that into the system and then make it available for others to use. Um, so again, a little grain of salt here, I should mention. It's just worth noting that and making sure that you you really do due diligence just to make sure that you're staying on uh, on the, the designated route that whatever land management agency or private landowner wants you on. So. Just beware and be careful, um, but it's still a really good app and good to use. Uh, that one's definitely subscription based, and so you you need to create an account, set up a subscription. So anyway, check them out. It's on X and on X Off Road. You can Google that and find their their links and find them on social media and that kind of thing. So um, that's a pretty good one. Not many people have heard about it yet, so I just want to share that one. Uh, Lifetime Trail Maps. I mentioned them earlier. I uh, think that I know they're a Southeast based company um, and they are Android only. It's a, a kind of a unique business model. They're a package subscription kind of deal where you can basically buy a Samsung tablet and have it preloaded with everything. And then it's subscription based so that uh, you can get monthly or annual updates. Um, and the hardware, you're basically buying hardware uh, that's preloaded. So. Uh, this may not be the best option for you if you're an Apple-only person, perhaps. Um, this doesn't really apply to you because they're only Android. But if you're Android um, and, and like the Samsung tablet, even if you've got one, I think that um, they have a, an option available, uh, I, I believe, through an app where you can actually access that through the hardware that you've already got. So if you've got a Samsung tablet, check them out. You can find out more information on their website. Um, I don't remember the, the website exactly, but you can you can Google them, I'm sure, and find them, Lifetime Trail Maps, find them on social media as well. There's links everywhere where you can access them and, and find out more information. Um, and the pricing structure is just kind of all over the place, depending on how far you want to go into it. I think their full premium package uh, with a higher end, high memory uh, Samsung device is upwards of 500 bucks, and then it comes down from there based on what you want somewhere in between. Um, as far as the, the buy-in, as far as how deep you want to go into it. So uh, really useful. They've got a, a ton of trails that they've, they've accessed. A lot of it is, uh, again, this is a lot of crowdsource data, but they've got some proprietary data as well that they've collected in-house. So it's kind of a mix. Um, but cumulatively, they're saying they've got nearly 100,000 miles of trail data nationwide. So that's a lot. Um, so check them out. That's, that's an option out there. Um, depending on if it fits the bill for you and, and kind of what you're after. So that's a good one. Uh, lead nav is kind of a one that I'm, I'm sure most folks east of the Mississippi River haven't heard about yet. It is extremely popular with off-road racers, like in the Ultra 4 Series out west with King of Hammers and those kind of races. Um, the reason being, um, it's, it's very, very focused on racers, and it's kind of centered race-centric, I guess, and racer-centric. Um, they have really good options for accessing imagery. Uh, I haven't mentioned imagery yet in any of these other apps, um, mainly because most folks watching this this evening are East Coast folks and we live underneath trees. And imagery doesn't really do you a lot of good. You're just looking at treetops. Unless you get winter imagery and pine trees, still get in the way. So it's kind of an issue in the East Coast to be able to really use imagery effectively. But out west, it's a whole other ball game because you, you can see everything on the ground basically by imagery. Um, and so it's, it's really good for racing and pre-running um, in a virtual environment. You can kind of cruise through that race course. Um, these are package subscription type um, setups with lead nav where, again, it's kind of however far you want to go with it, how much you want to pay to get the different levels and different tiers of capability within the app. Um, so it's hardware. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This is a misprint here. This is this is hardware based. I mean, you've got to have an Apple device only, uh, but you load it into that device. They do sell hardware. They sell full packages if you want to 
they, I think they call it a loadout, I guess is the term, where you can buy a full preloaded um, Apple device, app already loaded. They'll sell the little dual GPS buck to you as well if you want to do that independently. So it'll just talk to that uh, in cab mounted iPad. Um, but anyway, inside their app, you can actually go through and do pre running and pre trip planning. Um, drop all kinds of notes. So from a racer standpoint, if you're the navigator in the passenger seat in a race car racing at speed across open desert and you're trying to yell instructions to your driver with hazards that are coming up, stay left here, stay right, giant cactus coming up, whatever, you can preload all that into the app and query it up as you act, as you approach those, those hazards um, and those critical directions and turns and, and notes that you've made. So very robust app, very useful in that environment um, if you want to do that. East Coast, it's still useful. If you want to just be a weekend wheeler, you can still use it. Um, it certainly works in that environment as well. Um, just know that if you're buying it for the imagery, just realize what imagery you're probably going to be looking at. East Coast is just going to be treetops typically, so um, not much we can do about that. So anyway, that's lead nav. Again, that one's Apple only. I don't think I mentioned that, but it's it's 100% Apple only. Um, don't see them changing anytime real soon to go to Android. And then last but not least, um, of the ones that I'm going to cover in this session, uh, is Carta Tracks, our business. Uh, we use the Venza Maps app, as I talked about it earlier. It's Android and Apple. Um, so you can basically anywhere you can access the Google Play Store or the Apple Store to download apps, you can access our maps through that app. Um, so that includes the Insane Audio in-head unit as well. Uh, we work, our maps work offline without signal. All the maps are geo-referenced, so they know their place in space. And so if you download it ahead of time, which you, you should do, uh, once you get on the map, within the margins of the map, it'll show you the blue dot wherever you are on that map. So as you wheel around in a park, you can you can see exactly where you are in the park and how to get to different areas. Um, it doesn't have turn-by-turn -turn directions. You have to do your own uh, navigation of that using the map that we've created to and, and your blue dot to figure out how to get from point A to point B. Um, but anyway, the, the app uh, is what you would need to download. You buy the maps through our website. That's subscription-based now. We just revamped our website and relaunched it back in January with a whole new system. So if you haven't been to cartatracks.com in a while, I recommend you go and check it out. It's still the same domain, cartatracks.com, uh, but you'll find everything looks a little bit different. Um, pretty much on every map, you've got options for one year or, or annually renewing subscription. So you can have a, a cost up front for a buy-in on a map and then a little lesser rate that it'll charge you every year. So you can always have the very latest map. So if we push a new map on our server for Hawk Pride or something like that, um, then you'll get notification by email letting you know there's a new map. You can delete the old one and just re-download it at no additional charge um, to be able to access that if you've subscribed to it like that. Um, or you can just do the one year, one and done. It's good for a year, uh, free updates for a year. So if we update it, a week after you buy it, then you're good. You just re-download it. Easy peasy. Um, we also have some bundle map options now on the website. That's another thing that changed that I didn't mention in this uh, slideshow here that I'm going through. We've got options where we've bundled some maps. So there's places like if you're, I've seen some folks in, in uh, southeastern clubs that are making big trips out west maybe during the summer to go to Moab or uh, Sand Hollow or something like that. Uh, we've got bundles now where you can go and just buy all those maps in one bundle as a package deal. It's a little bit cheaper to buy it that way and you can just get them all at once. Um, so that's kind of a cool option uh, that we've offered. Um, then we've got, um, so the next part just to kind of differentiate us from pretty much all the others, what's really weird about us is that we make maps in-house. Most of the other options are apps and then they just are a way to facilitate data and, and use that data. So they're more of what I've kind of coined the phrase, I guess it's nerdy, but I call it an apping company where they're just making the app. It's the tool that allows you uh, to, to view and access that data, but they're not actually making maps necessarily. 
like Gaia is an example of that. They don't actually make maps necessarily. They just put all the tools in front of you to allow you to put something together to navigate with. But what's weird about, <clears throat> about us is that we're just kind of everything in one. The map has everything you should need to go into an off-road park and go wheel and have everything at your fingertips. Um, all the ratings are color-coded and that kind of thing. The data collection that we're doing, we do in-house. Um, well, not in-house. I'm doing it. I'm going down every single trail and collecting the data with a high-end sub-meter accurate GPS unit. It's what we call surveyor grade. It's super duper accurate. Um, out west, I've used that unit at Sand Hollow one day and I actually was able to see sub, well, like under half an inch accurate data one day where we had like no humidity, no tree canopy, just open sky, satellites, no interference whatsoever, and I got less than half an inch accuracy, which is just phenomenal. Um, so that's the unit that we collect with. In the eastern United States, when I get under tree canopy in the summertime, we're seeing less than a meter still So um, with that unit that I collect with. So that's still, I mean, sometimes it's one to two feet, typically, is what we'll see in that, that level of accuracy. So it's super duper smooth and clean data. And so you're getting the very best front end data and then we're producing really high quality maps from that data and then delivering it to you in just one big package just right there by itself as one map. So uh, we're doing it all in house. That's kind of what makes us weird and unique, but I think kind of special in this environment, in this world today. So um, we rarely get complaints about issues with our maps, but if you ever do see an issue on one, by all means, let us know. Uh, we're pretty quick to update things and, and fix it. So if you see something wrong, things change in the woods all the time. Usually the park owner do a pretty good job of letting us know, but uh, you can let us know if you see something. Um, and of course, we've got ratings. Um, we'll go in and rate them if the park owners don't have ratings yet set up on in their park. Uh, sometimes they've already got an existing rating system and we'll utilize those when we come in. Um, the last bit here I'll cover is our about our new website. One other thing I should add, the new website allows you now, if you want to download a map to your phone in Avenza, um, basically once you buy a map through us on our website, you can just stay logged in on the website and under my account and subscriptions, you can go to that screen under my subscriptions when you're logged in and simply tap a button that says tap to download in Avenza and it just kicks you out in Avenza and it starts downloading. So if you've been with Carta Tracks for a while and know about us, the old system, you had to copy and paste a link from an e email, which was just ridiculous. Bunch of hoops to jump through. The new system really makes it easier uh, to download into Avenza. You just tap a button in the browser and boom, it kicks you over to Avenza and it starts downloading. So really cool. Um, end game for us is developing an app. We're getting closer to doing that. Um, and that'll allow you to do the purchase on our website and then just go open the app, logged into your account in the app, and boom, there's your map. You download it right there in the app. Um, and there'll be some really cool stuff um, built into that app when we develop it that'll allow you to, um, I'll just say do some really cool stuff. I can't really share it yet, but um, it's going to kind of change things a little bit in the off-road environment. Uh, as far as navigating and doing some fun stuff at the same time. So it's coming. Just be patient. We'll get there. Uh, the more maps you buy today, the better that helps us get closer to developing it. So appreciate all the support from the folks that have helped us through the years. And uh, as we've grown and, and gotten closer, we're really appreciative of that. So so that's it on Carta Tracks. Uh, data sources. So in these other apps that I talked about, as far as where you can import data, from other places. Um, you got to pull in information. Sometimes it's a base layer map, like a like those Forest Service maps I was talking about earlier in, up in uh, South Dakota. Uh, so those kind of sources you can go and access from the Forest Service or the BLM, other land management agencies. Uh, the Forest Service has a pretty good website, and if you go to a particular forest, a lot of times you can find maps on the page for the particular forest. And they'll have a PDF that you can download into Avenza. That's the kind of file, it's a georeference PDF that you download into Avenza. Again, they're typically the black and white forest service maps that just have the forest service trail numbers on them. 
uh, but still it's something. So um, that's an option. BLM also, uh, if you don't know, BLM is Bureau of Land Management, um, not to be confused with the other BLM that you've probably heard about in the news lately, but um, the, this BLM is the Bureau of Land Management. They're tasked with managing a lot of our public lands, predominantly out west. They're very um, common out there. They're all over the place. There's a lot of BLM land. Uh, there are maps accessible there as well. They have closures, they have all kinds of issues that pop up and those maps are the best way to find out the latest information about those particular areas. Um, Johnson Valley, California, for instance, is butted up right against uh, US Marine Corps Base 29 Palms and they have kind of a moving boundary. They have different times of the year where there's closures and the Marine Corps is actually doing live fire drills. So you do not want to find yourself out there uh, if you do, you'll either get shot at or get a Black Hawk escort back off of uh, that area. So um, always good to go and check those out first. So that's federal sources. Um, apps that are utilizing that crowdsource data, again, Gaia, Backcountry Navigator, Onyx. Um, um, Lifetime Trail Maps also is another one. You can access some crowdsource data inside those apps. Um, <clears throat> they're good sources. So where do you get the data to pull into those? Some of the options I've got listed here, there's uh, traildamage.com, jeeptheusa.com, funtrex.com, that's the company I talked about out in Utah, Colorado area. There's a lot out there as far as data goes. There's even uh, Google, there's private user groups that you can access, um, KML and GPX tracks. Um, so do a little digging around. You, you can probably find it. Um, I really still just, as far as that kind of data goes, just make sure you're doing due diligence and you're vetting that information and what you're importing. Um, it's like Ronald Reagan used to say, trust but verify. That, that really applies here. Trust it, but verify it first. Make sure that it's, it's legit and it's legal. Um, cause just because it's out there floating around in the internet doesn't really mean that it's right. So just make sure you check that first, especially those that are in the, um, you know, forums and, and people just sharing data around. Make sure you know who you're getting it from and that it's trusted. So really, really important. Um, and then, of course, data sources. Um, we're, I guess, included in that. We're not exactly a data provider. We're a map provider, but there's data built in. So uh, I guess we could be listed there as well. So, okay. So again, we'll, we'll cover these risks about the crowdsource data. The spatial accuracy, meaning are you on the trail basically there's some risk there the and this kind of comes down to what unit the individual that collected the data was using so were they using a maybe one of these older garments perhaps we don't really know but if they use one of these older ones that's not seeing the glow nas and maybe the coming gps3 um, and they're just using just the plain gps satellites in tree canopy that can become highly inaccurate really, really quickly. Ask me how I know. I've, I, I started out trying to use these early on, and um, it's just not very accurate. So you can get some pretty bad degradation of that spatial accuracy if they collected that uh, or using that type of device. So just be aware of that. Um, the legality of it, I mean, we're not all perfect. There's people that mess up sometimes. Sometimes they don't even know they're messing up and they're going off trail. Um, if they don't go back and edit that out of the data where they messed up and they upload it and say, here, there's a track, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's right if they didn't go through and delete that information out. So um, you got some issues that you can run into there. And sometimes people just don't know that they're going onto private property. Sometimes they miss the sign. It, it just happens. So just be aware of that. Um, rating risks. It's really interesting talking about ratings and i've had a lot of discussions about this with people in our industry of cartography and map making and other businesses that do this um, and even some of the app providers and that kind of thing it's there's no standard right now the closest thing to a standard is really out west there's a, a kind of a, a recognized one to ten scale uh, for ratings one being the easiest ten being the hardest or most difficult um, that's good. I think sometimes it can get a little confusing for people when you're trying to differentiate between maybe like a five and a six. I think the intervals, there's just, there's just too many. I think 
maybe five or six is a little bit better. That's just me personally speaking on some experience here. Um, but there's no standard still, like universal standard nationwide. So when we go into parks, a lot of times we go into an environment where there's already been an established rating system that's been around for years before we got there. And the park owner says, yeah, just please use this. And we go, okay. And we just kind of live with it. Sometimes we modify it a little bit if they're okay with that. Uh, but there's no standard. So that's tricky. So just be aware if you're in a, a stock Jeep or something um, and you hit an easy trail, always, especially in crowdsourced data, if it's been rated, just always keep in mind that there's always a risk that that, that may not be accurate. And again, trails change. It rains. It erodes. Um, there's more traffic on the trails. There's things that change uh, since maybe that data was was put out there and maybe when it was rated initially. Um, so you've always got to be aware of that. And it can be risky if you're just getting in over your head on a trail that, that, that may have changed. So just be aware of that. Uh, so I do recommend uh, when you get into the changes, outdated stuff, uh, a good bit of advice from me, and this isn't just a, hey, I'm trying to sell car to tracks thing. There's other options for this as well. I mentioned a couple of times that some of these other apps, a sus subscription option, Lifetime Trail Maps is one um, where you've got a subscription. So if things change, hopefully the producer of that data uh, or map has updated that. And if you've got a subscription and you constantly have access to the latest and greatest data, that can keep you out of trouble. Um, so that's always a good option. So I always recommend the subscription option if you can. Otherwise, it's just a one and done, and that is just a screen, a snapshot in time for what that park or that trail looked like at that given day when it was collected by the, the collector of the data. Um, so the last risk I'm going to talk about, and this is uh, just something I should mention that's out there. People bring it up with me from time to time. Park owners kind of get fussy about it, too. Um, there's a lot of people that are selling maps out there, aside from Carta Tracks that sell maps. And there's two apps out there that are essentially the modern equivalent of what used to be Napster. If any of y'all remember Napster, the music pirating um, system where you could go and, and download free to you pirated music. This is kind of the same thing in maps. So it's kind of Mapster, so to speak. The two apps are called Maplets and Maprica. I am definitely not a fan of these. They're basically ripping us off and a lot of other people um, that are making maps and basically illegally copying the map and then producing it, putting it out there for people to, to access, um, which is a direct copyright in viol uh, violation and copyright infringement. So all of our maps are copyrighted. There's a lot of companies out there that are making maps that are also copyrighted. So. Uh, Always be careful with that. That's that's never a good thing. It's it is illegal, and um, both stores, Google Play and and Apple, continually fight these. And uh, I see a day probably coming when they're both eliminated from the app stores just because of the the copyright violations that are being done. So uh, both those two entities, Apple and and um, and Google, are both uh, pretty cognizant of that, especially on the music side. And I think they're beginning to understand it. Um, on, in this realm as well. So just wanted to mention it. Um, please don't use them. They're, they're not good. So, okay. So here's some new information that's coming out. Uh, we're going to talk about this new act that's been put into both, the, both chambers of Congress. It's called the Map Land Act, uh, 2020 bills, bipartisan. This is unusual. And uh, I'm hopeful that it goes through. What this is, is basically when I talked a little bit earlier when we were talking about Onyx Map and Onyx, or I mean, I'm sorry, Onyx Off-Road and Onyx Hunt, that app gives you access to all these property boundaries to be able to see whose land is whose and so forth. Um, they've done a really good job of trying to connect the dots between the server that has that information and your phone so you can actually see it um, and pull it up. But there's still a lot of gaps that are missing. And a lot of the federal land entities right now still have a lot of that information in print format only. There's no digital, digital version of that. So basically what the Map Land Act is going to do is um, it provides funding uh, from our tax dollars for the federal entities, BLM, Forest Service, and those, 
to go and digitize those and make them digital and make them more accessible for us to know whose land we're on. Hopefully it's our land, the, the federal land. Um, and we have, uh, you know, our rights to be able to be on those lands. So uh, this is a cool new bill. Um, really pushes us up into the 21st century if we can get there. I hope we can. Um, so anyway, more readily available in digital form. That's kind of the end line. So hopefully that goes through. Uh, you can Google Map Land Act if you want, read about it, see all the different uh, Congress people that have um, written the bill and, and, are, and are putting it into Congress for, for votes. So hopefully that goes through. Um, all right. So we talked about some hardware options. There's a lot out there, uh, not only in smartphones and tablets and iPads, but also in the, the more... Um, dedicated GPS units like the handheld uh, type devices. There's a lot of options out there. It just kind of all depends on what you're trying to mount. Uh, as far as phones go, I am a big fan personally of RAM mounts. They're a U.S. based company with lifetime warranties. I think they're in Washington or Oregon State, I believe. You can buy their products all over the place, from Amazon to buying them directly from their company to independent distributors. Um, Crawltoons is one option. I know you can buy from them. Lifetime Trail Maps has some RAM mount options as far as the base side, and then they've got mounts that hold the devices on the other end of that, that mount assembly. Um, you've got, so the base, you've got some temporary mounts like a suction cup mount if you wanted to stick it to a windshield which does pretty well sometimes. Even the RAM mounts, which are pretty robust, can still fall off sometimes. So uh, the one that I've got, I usually try and rest the phone on the dash so it kind of supports the phone end, and then the suction cup is obviously stuck to the windshield. That's a little bit more temporary, but it's kind of cool because let's say you got a tow rig and you're going to tow your Jeep to Moab. You can go and stick this guy in your Cummins diesel tow rig and drive out I-40 all the way, or I-70, or however you get there, utilizing that, and then pull it out and stick it in your Jeep when you go wheeling around the trails in Moab. So that's kind of cool. You can save a little bit of money there by having that temporary mount. And it helps with theft, too. You can go and lock it up at night if you don't have a lockable Jeep or something like that. Um, cage mount options. There's a bazillion of them out there for different size tubing. Um, kind of the standard in roll cages is inch and one, and I'm sorry, inch and three quarter. That's what I got in my Scrambler. Uh, Crawltune sells a nice uh, clamp that clamps around that, and then it utilizes this one-inch rubberized ball that then adapts to the ram mount um, end. So that's a really solid mount. It doesn't go anywhere. It won't fall off like a suction cup. I really prefer that. If you got a roll cage, uh, there's a couple of different companies that are making dash-mounted tracks that hold those little one-inch ball uh, ram mounts that, you know, you can attach them into your dash for like a Jeep or a Toyota 4Runner or something like that. So I think 6.7 Designs is one of those companies. There's a whole bunch of them that are making them now. Um, Carolina Metal Masters is a company that's been around Southern Four Wheel Drive for a long time. I think they've just moved into West Tennessee. So they're not really Carolina anymore. But anyway, look them up, Carolina Metal Masters. They have got uh, some grab bars that go up in the corners, uh, like in your A-pillar if you got a cage or stock mount in a, in a JK. Um, and they utilize that same one-inch rubberized ram mount ball. That's Actually, there's isn't rubberized. I think they're machine aluminum, which is really solid. Um, so anyway, that's a good company to look at. You can do custom mounts. I've seen people, especially in buggies and that kind of thing, they'll mount an iPad mount into the dash, just hard mounted in there. Uh, which is pretty slick and nice and clean. Um, so that's a kind of more custom mount. Again, Crawltunes. <clears throat> Crawltunes make speaker cans and stereo systems. They're out of Texas, but they carry a lot of these RAM mounts. So they're a good source for that. Uh, Lead Nav carries a lot of the hardware mounting devices for iOS devices, and they sell those dual GPS receivers as well. Lifetime trail mounts. If you can see the picture there, um, Mike, you might want to adjust the screen where you can see this whole full screen without me in the picture if you want. Um, there's a lot of mounts that they carry that give you a lot of different options for mounting those Samsung tablets. 
Um, so that's a good option. That image is up on the screen there. So check, check out Lifetime Trail Maps if you want to buy the hardware from them. Um, good solutions there. And that's pretty much all I got for this discussion. Um, I hope that there have been some questions that have been put up. Um, if you've got any, and Mike's maybe taking some notes as we've gone through. I haven't paid attention to comments during this session, but um, I'll let Mike start fielding those or sending those questions downrange to me, and I'll see if I can field some of them if there are some. So with with that done, we'll we'll go and talk through some questions. Awesome, yeah, tons of great information there, guys. Um, and just to reiterate about the um, kind of open source data that you find in some of the apps, I'm a big user of Gaia. Uh, when I'm out west mapping routes and things like that. And I have ended up um, on routes that were mapped by people and shared online. Um, I have ended up where I shouldn't be and had to turn around and pull back out because you end up on someone else's property. So it's a big deal. Um, and it makes these people rather ill uh, when this information shared, almost like, uh, you know, hey, come right through my property. So Keep that kind of stuff in mind, because especially, you know, for us in the off-road industry, we kind of have that black eye of being goofballs all the time. So we have to protect that quite a bit. But without further ado, we got some really cool questions here. I think some of them are really good. Um, so first off, uh, from Blake, um, any chance of mapping Windrock OHV Park? <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's number one question. And, it, and far for the course, it's our number one question we always get. Um, I'll say there's a chance still. We've had we've got a good relationship with the park. Um, they wanted to do some things in-house first and see how that worked. They do currently have an app that you can download. That app also has some information um, and some tools in the app for cabin rentals and some other things. I haven't checked it out lately to see what all they've added to it, but they want to do some of that stuff in-house. Um, I, I don't think the door is closed. I think there's still a possibility for Carta Tracks to do that. Um, but good relationship. I'm not going to say no, but um, hopeful that it, it happens someday. So, But check out their app. They've got them. You can buy their existing park map um, inside that app and download it inside there. And as far as I know, it works offline, um, and you can utilize it inside that app. So check them out. I'm sure you can get more information about that by going to Winrock's website. Yeah. Um Next, we've got a uh, Scott Pope. Any thoughts on the View Ranger app? View Ranger, I am unfamiliar with that one, Scott. You'll have to to fill us in a little bit more about that. I I can study it. There's stuff that pops up constantly. I, I kind of hit the main ones tonight. Um, it's a moving target, but we're you know, as our business, I I kind of I pay attention obviously to a lot of the other apps that are out there and and kind of look at what kind of features are available and that kind of thing. Um, but that's a new one to me. I think I've heard of it, but I, I really don't have any experience in it. Awesome. Um, Mike Curtis said, will Avenza consume, uh, ARC GIS services? Gotcha. Okay. So ARC GIS, as we say it in this world is ARC GIS. Um, that's a, the parent company is Esri. I am not really sure. There, there are two companies that kind of butt heads with one another. Uh, Avenza is a Canadian company, and Esri is a United States-based company. I believe they're out in California. Esri's a really good one as far as GIS, which is Geographic Information Systems. That's basically what you'd run into with um, you know, municipalities, cities that are trying to manage manhole covers and those kind of things. But um, I think there's probably just some um, conflict of interest there between the two companies. So I'm not really sure if that'll ever be able to, to work out, but it'd be nice for sure. Yeah. Um, Jason Gunn, have you checked out Trailview mobile app? I am just limited uh, experience with that one as well. Kind of like the one that Scott Pope mentioned. Really don't have a lot of experience with it either. Um, there's, there's a lot of apps out there. Um, and a lot of them, it's just a variety of different tools and different capabilities of each one. So, um, but another one, I'll make a note, I'll go back and rewatch this and, and make some notes and, and study some of them. So, yep. Awesome. Um, Cody Boone said, does Carta tracks work when your cell service goes out? Will it still track you? Absolutely. Yes. That's the coolest thing. 
Um, any maps that you download into Avenza do work offline. Um, you just have to make sure you've got it downloaded before you lose signal, um, but it will work without cell signal. I do recommend if you're in a situation with a phone or tablet or something like that that is just sucking down battery like nobody's business and you just can't keep it charged when it's running, I do recommend that people put that device in airplane mode. That'll help a lot because what it's doing, it's also trying to you know, grab cell signal. And if you can turn that out of the equation and turn it off, um, it'll still work with the GPS satellites and the internal GPS chip to put the blue dot on it, um, but it'll help maintain your battery life if that's if that helps. So, but yes, it definitely works without cell signal. Just download it beforehand. Yep. Awesome. Good question. And then um, Holly Slade Bomber, can I get a job with you? Sorry, Holly, but I'm first on the list. Job opening comes up. <laughs> yeah, we're not hiring yet. We get asked that a lot. We've uh, we're working on a game plan, maybe to to maybe expand our 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 rate of data collection. Uh, maybe buy some more hardware units uh, with some some vetted qualified data collectors. So you're always welcome to email us uh, at cartatracks at gmail .com and we'll take a look at a resume and your background. But uh, you got to be pretty physically fit. It's pretty uh, pretty taxing. I don't drive everything. I do a lot of walking, so be prepared for that. Don't skip left. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah, I remember Jake coming out and mapping the URI trails, and he mapped everything: the horse uh, back trails, mountain bike trails, hiking, all that. Um, and if I remember right, it was like July or August or sometime when you did that, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like the stupidest time anybody could ever try and do that. But yeah, it was <laughs> pretty warm, pretty humid. And, uh, and and you already remember it's like maybe 15 miles of OHV. So that's the only motorized anything that I could utilize. So the rest of the 150 miles was all on my two legs or on a mountain bike. I rode a lot of the trails on mountain bike that I could that I could ride. So that sped it up a little bit, but it's still me powered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, next, we've got Doug Callis. Um, better to uh, map trails in winter or late fall? Good question. Uh, definitely winter. Really, the biggest thing is just tree canopy. That's the biggest issue. If I had to pick a time of year, especially in the eastern United States, to map, it's January, February time frame. That's absolutely the best time just because you don't, the tree canopy and the, the broadleaf leaves hold a lot of uh, water content, and that's a, a major impact on your GPS signal. So, no leaves means better signal. So winter time's the best. Awesome. Um, then from uh, uh, Seneca, South Carolina High School group, um, any new trails on the East Coast being mapped? Uh, well, the next map, I guess we're talking the quarter tracks here, I guess. I'm, and there's people mapping stuff all day. But um, for quarter tracks, the next map we'll probably go live with is going to be Boneyard in Kentucky. It's right off of the Daniel Boone Backcountry Byway. Um, still waiting on a few little details to tidy up with the park management there as far as how we want that information conveyed appropriately. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty important one. There's, there's just a lot of questions about property boundaries in that region. Um, and it's, it's nobody's fault really other than just the, the nature of the beast of uh, little poorly funded county tax assessor's offices. They don't really have the manpower to, to get this stuff in a digital realm yet. So. Uh, we're working with them, trying to nail down exactly how to best convey uh, what trails are on whose property and that kind of thing. But um, that'll be the next one. So Boneyard awesome. in uh, East Central Kentucky. Awesome. Um, another question from Mike Curtis. Um, he said, can I make my own geo PDFs and use them with the Venza or the new app for Cardo Tracks? Uh, new geo PDFs. There's no way that you can make them with the Venza maps or through Carta Tracks. Um, however, there is a way where you can, you have to have a base map first. So the area you're going into, if you want to maybe collect your own data or attribute it with your own information, you have to have some kind of base map so that you're on the map, so to speak. And then in a Venza, Anything that you add on top of that, as far as layers, points, lines, and areas, those can then be exported out of the app in different file formats like GPX or KML. 
Uh, again, I recommend KML. I like that because you can go and open it right up into uh, Google Earth and look at it there if you want to view it. But you can share that, those layers that you add on top of the base map. So you can use a Carta Tracks map as your base map, and then you can add all kinds of attribution on top of that if you want. Um, for instance, this is the cool waterfall. Um, and you can take a picture with your phone of the waterfall or maybe a really difficult obstacle or something like that. Take a picture with it, and then you drop a pin in the app. And then you can tap the pin and it'll open up a whole bunch of information that you can populate, like the name of the pin, you know, what you want to title this. You can attribute that pin with the picture you just took of the obstacle or the waterfall, whatever, um, change colors of symbology and all that kind of stuff. And then that all get, gets exported out in that KML. So um, that's kind of a cool tool that you can use. But there's no way to export a georeference PDF out of Avenza. So. Awesome. Well, so that's the last question we've got uh, tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, make sure you guys go to www.cartatracks.com and check out the maps that uh, that Jake and his wife offer. Um, again, I've used these maps uh, on a professional level and they work extremely well um, uh, offline, right? And we all know how iffy cell service can get when we're on the trails. Um, which is to our benefit, right? We don't want to get messed with when we're on the trails, but um, check them out. Go to their Facebook page. Um, I believe you guys have an Instagram as well, correct? Yes, absolutely. Instagram and Facebook. I don't really bother with Twitter. It bores me. Yeah. So go <laughs> check those out. Um, make sure you like, follow them uh, so you can keep up to date with all their information. Uh, and if you see Jake at an event and his cool str uh, scrambler, Make sure you talk to him. He'll give you an awesome tour of it um, and shake his hand and thank him for supporting Southern Four Wheel Drive Association, um, which he's done for uh, a tremendous amount of time. Um, so, and thank him for putting on this live. Uh, but if you guys uh, need maps, you know where to get them now, cartatracks.com. So thanks a ton, Jake. And um, we hope to see you soon, man. Absolutely. Yeah, Mike, let me add one other thing too. You mentioned seeing me at events. Uh, the next known one that we know is actually going to happen in this whole COVID world is going to be the Great Smoky Mountain Jeep Invasion in Pigeon Forge coming up in August. So check them out. We will be there. Uh, traditionally, Southern has been set up there as well. They've had some uh, little classes that they'll do and, and sessions on Tread Lightly. I've done some talks there. Um, great way to engage with us. If you've got any questions more that you think of between now and August, uh, you can always ask me there if you're going to that show. Um, we travel quite a bit. We go out west to Trail Hero. That's coming up. Um, that's in first weekend of or week of October. Uh, but anyway, if you if you run across this, by all means, don't hesitate to ask. I'm I'm always happy to help folks, even if it's outside of Carta Tracks. Just help people out. That's what I love doing, um, and and helping people wheel where they're supposed to go and stay on trails. And um, and if you got any other questions, you can always email us. Our email address is cartatracks at gmail.com. Um, or you can just engage with us somehow through Facebook or something like that. Um, and our phone number, my, my phone number's on the website. So if you need us, just always reach out. If you got any questions, any issues, it's what we do. We, we fix people up, take care of you. So uh, just don't hesitate to ask. Awesome. Thanks a ton, Jake. Um, tons of great information. All right, everybody. So that brings a close to our uh, modern mapping in the off-road world uh, tech net session. Um, at this point in time, if you haven't said cartography rocks or told us I like BFGs, KM3s, or KO2s, which is your favorite, it's too late to enter for this week because it's time for us to get offline. Um, weekend coming up, guys. Get outside. Get outdoors. Adventure. Do some wheeling. Have a good time. Um, and be safe doing it. So thanks a ton, Jake, and we will see you guys on the trail. Carta Track Maps can give you unparalleled access to custom maps complete with topographical contours, accurate trail data, and points of interest. Accurate vetted data and information, including trails and important points of interest. No service required. Your location will be automatically updated by GPS as you go. 
With over 25 years of experience, Cardotrax maps are clean and easy to use, complete with contour lines, letting you know what is up and what is down. Cardotrax. Smart mapping. Visit us today at cardotrax.com.